Hey everybody, this week we are on location at the Luxor with the world's most famous magician, Chris Angel. Hey everybody, welcome to a very, very special episode of Inside Quest. Our goal is to take you inside the minds of the world's most effective thinkers so you can learn with ease what they have learned with great difficulty. And if you pay close attention, I promise our guests are gonna help you acquire the behaviors and thought patterns you're gonna need to be successful. Today's guest is a dear friend of mine and one of the hardest working people I have ever met. And I know some freakishly hard working people, but there are just few cases of success through sheer force of will that I have seen that rivaled this man. Part entertainer, part rock star, and all heart, he has dominated the world of magic for over a decade and loomed large over the Vegas Strip for almost as long with his smash hit show, Believe. But it all began in very humble surroundings. Born in Long Island, New York to Greek immigrants, he fell in love with entrepreneurship and magic at a young age, ultimately marrying the two to build an unprecedented magic empire. Known for his around the clock grind, which I've witnessed, I promise you is real, this overnight success, 18 years in the making of course, performs roughly 400 live shows a year with attendance of over 500,000 people. He's performed more hours of primetime magic than any other magician in history, through his show Mind Freak, the most successful magic show of all time, with six seasons and 100 episodes. And on top of that, his online videos have more than 300 million views on YouTube alone. His do or die attitude, coupled with the timing and presence of a bona fide rock star, has helped create this oversized fan reaction and firmly established him as the face of modern magic. He's been parodied, satired, and worshiped in equal measure, elevating him above the genre of magic and placing him firmly in the pantheon of pop culture icons. And when you spend time with this passionate, insanely creative and super intense guy, you get the feeling that despite his just scary level of success, that this is only the beginning. Please help me in welcoming the creator, director, executive producer, and star of the new smash hit Vegas show, Mind Freak Live at the Luxor the most successful magician of all time, Chris Angel. Thank you so much. Great to have you here. Welcome to uh, my Mind Freak Live theater here at the Luxor. Thank you, man. We're on stage. This is the first time I've ever done something, but it was you, and I wanted to do something special, and I figured this would be a great opportunity to do it right here. Thank you, man. That really means a lot. And, um, you know, so that people know, we, we really do know each other quite well. I actually went on a, a two-city tour with you on the East Coast That's when true. you uh, took the show on the road. And watching your work ethic is insane. And what you do and the way that you have uh, persevered against all odds. Um, walk us through, in your house, which I've had the very good fortune of going to, there are two things framed next to each other. One is a rejection letter, and then one is a newspaper clipping. Tell people about that. Well, I came to Vegas in the 90s for the first time, and I had uh, big dreams. And uh, saw a lot of billboards of Siegfried and Roy and wanted to live my dream like so many others prior to me. And I went to a management uh, company that was a C-level agency, and... Uh, asked if they would rep me and uh, basically got a rejection letter, not from the person, uh, but from his assistant, kind of passing on me and wishing me the best of luck. Right. Well, that uh, can do two things to a person. It could fuel you or it could make you want to give up. For me, it was my fuel because I really believed in myself. And uh, so in my office, I have that. And next to it, I have... Uh, story from a very significant publication uh, talking about the types of dollars I bring in. <laughs> so that to me is like the perfect place to begin telling your story because um, I, 
I find that people look at a tableau of success, right? They look at what you've accomplished and they coin you the overnight success, right? Which is ironic, of course, because you, you really earned your reputation. This is one of my favorite stories about you. You earned your reputation as a grinder, right? So there's that story about the um, Halloween convention where you did the same, I love this, the <laughs> same 10 minute magic routine, 50 to 60 times a day, right? For 12 days. Uh, yeah, it was, it was absolutely insane. I did about 600 shows in a period of, I think, 11 or 12 days. Um, and I did whatever I had to do. Uh, I was uh, desperate to realize my dream. I worked 18 years, as I said, to become an overnight success, dreamt about it even longer than that, and was willing to do whatever I had to do to get one step closer to my dream. And so I did uh, a lot of shows. I've done shows for free. I've done birthday parties. I've done corporate shows. I've uh, played in S&M clubs, I've played in gay clubs, I've played in straight clubs. I played wherever I could get an audience. Mm. And that really allowed me to hone my skills uh, as a performer, as a producer, as a creator. Mm. And then I also went on public access TV. And it cost me money to do that, but I wanted that experience when I was in my teens. Right. I did whatever I had to do to learn the business because my family didn't come from an entertainment background. I was the first, and uh, being the first means that you have to get educated. And my dad always taught me that if you wanted to be good at something, you had to understand all the different aspects of that business. My dad was in the restaurant business, so he washed dishes, he uh, swept the floor, he was the cashier, he was the cook, he was the, uh, the host, uh, he was the boss. And he really instilled in me to really understand all aspects of what I wanted to accomplish in order to um, be able to appreciate and strategize the best game plan to accomplish it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, clearly whatever game plan you put together really worked. Sheer force of will is, is how I think about it. And being around you, that's what it feels like. Um, and, and one thing for anybody watching at home, the most interesting thing when you get to spend time with him is he's always on. You're always working. And even just now, when I met you backstage, there was something you guys are trying to work on for the show and, and your mind is, is working and uh, you hugged and, and you said, oh God, I, I shouldn't do that because I'm sick. And I'm like, of course, but no one would ever know. Like you just, you're, you're always pushing it forward. And the question becomes, how, how the hell, after all this success, do you stay so hungry to just keep getting better, right? Because you could have let Believe just run its course, right? You could have sure. finished out the contract, sure. making stupid money. It can't be about the money anymore. No. Um, but you didn't. You wanted to rejuvenate and, and have. Well, for me, the, uh, as Bill O'Coin, a great manager of Kiss and Billy Idol back in the day, once told me when I was sitting next to a garbage dumpster, uh, very depressed. He said, the journey is much greater than a destination. Uh, and what he meant by that, it's a lot easier to get where you want to go, even though it seems very difficult at the time. But once you get there, to remain there, to remain the most relevant at your craft, takes even more work. Um, and so for me, I never look over my shoulder at what others are doing or what what, have, what I have done, I always look ahead into the future about what I want to do. And I never believe my own hype. You know, I'm only as good as my last show. And I'm only as good as my next show. And for me, it's about that nexus between what I've done and what I want to do in order to grow as a human being and as an artist. How do you motivate yourself when you're sick, tired, exhausted? Like, how do you keep... You've never missed a show, if I'm not mistaken. I've never missed a show outside of when my son was diagnosed with cancer. Okay. And I had to uh, immediately... I took off of uh, Believe, Cirque and uh, Luxor were great in allowing me to go and see my son immediately in Australia, which was for a week. But outside of that, I've never missed a show in my life. Um, I'm very focused, I'm very disciplined, and I think that um, um, that kind of passion and tenacity and stick to is what allowed me to flourish. Magic changed my life, and magic has changed many lives. Um, not in the sense of, hey, I want to be a magician, but in the sense of inspiring, mm. showing 
people that, you know what, anything is possible. It might look impossible, but it can be possible if you put your mind to how to accomplish it. And so I always say to my audience that I'm not special, I'm not different. I'm like everybody out there, young and old. If you have a dream, you can live your dream. But there's no substitute for sweat equity, for passion, and for perseverance to, to, to understand um, what you want to put together a realistic goal and to work toward it no matter how long it takes to accomplish. Eventually, you can live your dream like I'm living mine. And one of the things that I find in society today is there's more negativity than ever. And it's very dangerous if you allow yourself, especially a young person that has a dream, to allow that to come in and infiltrate their mind in a way where they, they, they doubt themselves. You always have to believe in yourself. Um, that is so important. If you don't believe it, no one else will. How do you handle self-doubt? Um, I, I'm a very confident person because I put the sweat <laughs> equity in. Right. Um, I'm very confident because I've done my due diligence. I mean, I, I work 21, 23 hours a day. I work seven days a week. I, I believe that the mind controls the body. The body's just a slave to the mind. And what you think is what you are. And your body follows suit. If you believe it, um, eventually it will happen. It's why athletes visualize their high jump, what that fight looks like before they even get into a ring. Mm. It's all about how you prepare yourself mentally um, with whatever task is at hand. Yeah, that's, that's what I love about magic. So um, I've told this story many times about how you and I actually came to know each other. Uh, I, I love magic. I've taken classes at the Magic Castle. I've got my small repertoire of tricks that I'll do uh, in private. <laughs> um, and what I, what I absolutely fell in love with magic for is exactly what you're talking about. And, and it's, it's what I respect in you as an artist. It's why I really wanted to get you on the show is you have confidence because you've put in the sweat equity, right? You know that you've done the work to truly be the best you that you can be. And look, maybe it fails, whatever. It almost doesn't matter because you're going to show up every day, sick or not, doesn't matter. You're going to show up every day and you're going to give everything you have. And what makes magic magic, and this is where I think people almost cheapen it by saying, well, there must be something supernatural. And there's not, right? You're just like everybody else. You don't claim to be a psychic or anything like that. But what you have done that is truly magical, in my opinion, is... You've just dug so deeply into something to figure out either the psychology or the physics or the engineering. I mean, whatever it is that you need to pull off the illusion, even if it's sleight of hand or something grander than that, but you've put in that work. Whether you want to be successful in business or directly in magic, it's the same thing, right? It's putting in that sweat equity of doing so much work, so much work, that people will sooner believe that you're a psychic right, than you believe you well. work that hard, right? Because you do it well. It's incredible. right? It, that's the payoff. If you do something really well in magic, it looks effortless. Just like, you know, uh, you take a great basketball player or an athlete that makes their job look easy and then somebody goes on the court and realizes how hard it is to score a basket. It's that... Um, as they say, 10,000 hours yeah. uh, that makes it look effortless. But I think it's not just in magic. I think it's a life lesson. I mean, no matter what you want out of life. And I think <clears throat> in today's society, it's very easy to become like an entitlement society that you want handouts. You don't want to have to work hard. And I think that's very dangerous because I think that sense of self-worth and gratification comes from putting in that sweat equity. Mm. The harder it is to achieve a goal, the sweeter it is. If it were easy, everybody would be accomplishing it, right? right? And that's true no matter if you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer or a magician or a singer or you know, whatever it is. Why are certain you know, companies that have bars not successful? Why is Quest just the number one bar? It's because you believed in it. You, you and your partners believed in it. You used the product. You understood what was needed and where there was a void in the marketplace and you filled it and you did it wholeheartedly. And that's why I use your product. That's why I endorse your product because it is 
for real. It's not just thrown together to make money. It's never about money. If you set out to do something for money, nine out of 10 times, it will not work out. When you set out to do something out of passion, money's a byproduct. Yeah, that's so true. And I want to talk about your father for a second. Is that something that you learned from him? Absolutely. My dad, um, you know, my dad busted his ass to provide a better life for his children. He never had a handout. He wouldn't take a handout. He was too proud. And, and he showed us at a very young age, when I was probably 10 years old, how to sell things, sell musical instruments. He would, if I wanted a new drum set, I had to sell my drum set. I had to earn money. I had to work at the restaurant. I had to wash dishes. I had to then grow up and get into being a cashier and deal with money and bookkeeping. And sometimes that um, is more valuable than going to college. And for me with magic and having that background and having that passion and desire to be the best and to want to learn whatever I didn't know to become the best and to understand what I needed to understand in the business aspect, I did for many years, you know. Uh, in school, I was in slow classes. Um, I couldn't retain information. I couldn't really write well. And then I had to put together a business plan when my dad was sick. And I had to write a business plan, a book, essentially to get investors to put money into my dream. Mm. And I had to figure out how to do that and how to put that together and how to write that. And that process, which took me about a year to do, um, really perpetuated um, my ability to communicate writing. And it's grown since then. So. I'm um, somebody that will learn whatever I need to learn in order to achieve what I have in my mind. And there is nothing that will stop me from doing that. That's my attribute. That's what I'm good at. I, I'm not the greatest magician. I'm not the greatest singer. I'm not the greatest dancer. But when I'm committed to create something that I have in my mind that I believe is unique and different, I'll work 24-7 to provide that experience. Yeah, I've, I've witnessed that. And I think it, so you obviously have, your persona is so unique and so different and so uh, a crow left of the murder, as it were. How did you have the, the guts and the belief in your vision? Because even your family, and I've met your mom, lovely human being, she's amazing. Um, but she wanted you to be a lawyer or a doctor. I mean, it's literally yeah. the classic tale, man. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. So how did yeah. you, and in the beginning, you were way more gothic than this. Like, yeah. I mean, the shot of you in Times Square with the face paint, the really long hair. I just thought, how did he have the guts to be that? Well, I told my mom uh, if I wasn't, I wasn't going to go to college and if I wasn't a millionaire by the time I was 18, I, I would go to college. Well, neither one of those two things I <laughs> promised came true. Uh, eventually, it came true, one of them. Um, but for me, uh, I, just, um, I just thought magic was really hokey. Mm. It was like not a product of the times. It was presented as kind of this cheap, hokey novelty. And it never really garnered the respect that, say, uh, the cinema or that the music industry did. Mm. And I think it was because it was this niche kind of way that people were presenting it. And to think that um, magic which was a beautiful art form, but didn't have the right sensibility for pop culture, I just thought there was a huge opening there, and it was really me. It wasn't something that was contrived. I mean, I was a student and a product of MTV. Right. You know, I love Dolly and Fellini, and, and wanted to incorporate that stuff in my art. I studied music for 12 years. Wow. So music was a natural influence in my magic. So I wasn't gonna use the kind of cheesy music and approach that many people did, which worked for them, but not sure. for me. I mean, my whole thing was youth, was pop culture, was excitement, energy, spectacle, and, and bringing something to magic that, that had never been present. And I think that's what engaged the public in such a significant way. And I think the greater reason why I really caught on fire with Mind Freak was the message, was there was something more to the tricks than just tricks. It was the magic of emotion. It was the ability to connect to people on an emotional, visceral level 
and it enabled people to connect to me and get the greater message, which is positivity. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's so spot on the money and you're super, super self-aware. And I wonder how much of that is just you in your own head thinking through things. Like, how did you begin to put those puzzle pieces together? And the reason I'm asking is I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about the kids at home, right? The, somebody tuning in, either they're way deep into their life, 30, 40, um, they realize they're living someone else's life and have been their whole time, or they're a teenager and they're coming up and they're about to hit a crossroads. And in that moment, they don't have the, I fear, self-awareness that you have. They definitely do not have the self-confidence that you have. And they don't yet have the mental framework to understand, well, you've got to become confident, right? You've got to have the belief to believe in yourself. What are things that that person can do to find their voice, right? In the din of all the other people barking at them to be a doctor or a lawyer, how do they find that thing that's authentically them? It's simple. Be true to yourself. Being a doctor, a lawyer, a millionaire, an entrepreneur, uh, doesn't equate to happiness. What equates to happiness is doing what you love. And the things that you can't buy are the most valuable, love, health, and happiness. Society has put essentially um, a factor of relating success to money, to purchasing things. And when you come into money, you purchase all these things and you realize it doesn't make you happy. Right. So, you know, my dad always told me to set a goal, set a goal, set a goal. Well, I've achieved my goal and then some. But I also sacrificed so much of my life to do that. Now, in hindsight, was it worth it? Was it worth taking time that I could have had with family, with loved ones, with my dad before he passed on right. to achieve a goal? I don't know. And that's a question that everybody has to answer for themselves. But don't do something that you're doing because of money. I mean, I know we live in a society where you have to pay bills, but you can do that fairly easy. Um, and you don't have to sacrifice so much to do that. I'm contradicting my whole life, but it's where I've come to a place where I, I question that. You know, my success, what I do is amazing, but I'm also a slave to it. It's a love-hate relationship. I'm just being completely honest with all the people that are watching. No, I love that. And I find that people that are in similar situations to me have the same love-hate kind of mentality. It's almost like a drug, mm. and I don't do drugs, but my career is like a drug that you want to fix, but then you want to take a rest. But then you want to fix, but then you want to take a rest. Right. And it's this vicious cycle. When I'm on stage, there's no greater feeling. The audiences are amazing. Seeing people cheer and applaud and have that sense of wonderment and happiness in their life. And to give them the ability to have that 90 minutes of escapism escaping reality, escaping their problems, and seeing that anything is possible is beautiful. But there's never any Chris time. And that's a balance I have to find. So to answer that question, for me, is kind of unfair because I haven't really found the true meaning of happiness, the true essence of what that means. I'm happy sometimes. I'm happy with my career, but I'm not happy all the time. I mean, what person is? I, I don't know if that exists. But I think being true to yourself is something that sounds easy, but is probably harder than it sounds. Can we really muddy the waters for a second? Sure. All right, let's get a little crazy. Yeah. So you've touched on something that is at the center of my life. Uh, my business partner, Ron, and I call it the sickness. And in a minute, as I tell the story, think about what your answer is going to be. But if somebody's really, really thinking about achieving at the highest level, echoing as I call it, they want to echo on a global scale, should they do it or not? We're both going to answer that in a second. But first, 
the sickness, right? So as I was taking my notes on what you and I were going to talk about, that kept coming into my mind. Of all the people that I know, dude, honestly, you're the one most driven by the sickness. Now, that sickness to me is, is, is hunger, but it's beautiful. Like it's a beautiful hunger and it lives in me and it drives me and it pushes me to to do something great. And I think of it when, you know, when I think about the people that have really impacted me, um, many of them through commerce, the first one that comes to mind is, is Steve Jobs with Apple and what he did and how I felt, you know, in the early days of those computers and seeing that ad that was like, the ones crazy enough to believe they can change the world actually do. Like I have the chills now just saying it. And when I was watching that commercial, it, I fell in love with the idea of using an economic vehicle to change the world. And that's a huge part of why I ended up doing what we're doing at Quest, is really believing through these products and through painting a picture for people. You can make a difference. You can really make a difference, like for real. But to, to stay hungry, there's a, a great quote introduced to me by Bo Eason. He didn't say it, but he introduced me to it. And he said, it's called hunger in paradise, right? How do you stay hungry in paradise? Like you beyond my wildest dreams, Chris. My dreams have come true. Like wealth creation, impact on people's lives, all of it. But I'm more driven today than I was when I was literally starving, right? Trying to scrounge and buying three burritos for 99 cents, and right? Like right. I'm, I'm more driven and more hungry now because I can feel like the scale on which I can impact people grows. And as the scale on which I can impact people grows, the more I'm hungry for that fix, the more I want to do, the more hours I spend doing it, and the more I realize that that sickness is at the center of my life. But it's beautiful, right. and I love it. But I, I get the melancholy that you're talking about. But here's, here's the thing. If you, if you died right now and your life was over, would you feel content? It's an interesting question. I'll answer it in the way that I view the world. Um, I am never content. That word in particular, I find I don't chase contentedness. In fact, I would get a little tense if I became content uh, because content will draw me back from having the impact. Would you on the feel world fulfilled? I yes, I feel fulfilled in my life right now, okay. definitely. And, and I, it's not as high a fulfillment as I would like, and you know, I'm not in some Zen state, but um, I try to set my life up in a way where I'm outward facing as much as inward so that I'm helping other people as much as I'm helping myself. Um, that definitely is Well, that's, that's that. important. So for me, what I've done and what I've discovered through my child, uh, I've been working with children since 2001. And I, uh, I didn't do it for any public attention. This is before I was even known as Chris Angel. Um, and I did you know, work with children with cancer and different uh, charities and, and organizations to benefit kids. And then I uh, worked a lot with Make-A-Wish and children's pediatric cancer. And then I had my son who was diagnosed with ALL before he was even two years young. And uh, I've realized and I believe wholeheartedly that the reason why I am blessed with so much success beyond my wildest dreams is to do the, my work for the greater good of children. And that is my life mission right now. That trumps my show, trumps my TV show, trumps anything I do. All of this is to be utilized to bring awareness, research, and treatment to hopefully find a cure for pediatric cancer to make it eventually disappear. September 12th is the biggest event of my life. On this stage, I'm trying to raise a million dollars in one night. 100% of the proceeds will go to pediatric cancer for research and treatment. I'm funding it out of my own pocket. I have incredible celebrity friends that are joining me on this stage, like Jerry Lewis, um, Tony Orlando, uh, Wayne Newton, Siegfried and Roy, Gary Oldman, Bon Jovi's Richie Sambora, Gene Simmons of Kiss. I even got Oprah Winfrey, Celine Dion, Jennifer Lopez, Britney Spears, Elton John to contribute. Wow. This is going to be one of the biggest events, and I'm hoping it's going to become an annual television event, like the telethon, but a modern-day version of it. Mm. Because I see these kids, I see what these kids go through, and one child every three minutes will be diagnosed with pediatric cancer. I believe this is the beginning and the start of my life's work which is to use my celebrity, to use my fame, and to use the dollars that I've been blessed to have 
um, for these children, to be a champion and a voice for these kids. And that's where I believe my happiness will ultimately lie. It's, that uh, is beautiful beyond measure, and obviously you and I had talked about that, and, and I think what you're doing is incredible, and I know that it actually, um, you were doing something very similar with your father and the foundation with him. Right. I just want to clarify one thing you said about you funding this yourself. You pay all the administrative costs, all that, to make sure that 100% of the donations actually end up used. I, I don't sure. believe, I don't believe in, just personally speaking, uh, in charity that takes out administration costs, that takes out you know, any expenses. It should cost you time, and if you have money, it should cost you money. That is the true meaning of charity for me. And I uh, believe that that's what I meant to do, and I believe that's why I have a child that has cancer. Um, Johnny Christopher um, is an amazing kid. He changed my life. And uh, he'll be here at this event on September 12th. And if people want more information, you can go to chrisangelhelp.com. It's only $50 for a ticket to see this legendary show on September 12th. And if you can't be here, you can still make a difference. Go to chrisangelhelp.com to learn how. It's amazing. Um, And it goes back to the question that we both have to answer, which is there's people at home right now that uh, they have to make a decision. Part of them wants to have the level of success that you've had. They want to pursue a path. It doesn't have to be in performing, but they want to pursue a path that ends in that sort of grand scale accomplishment. Uh, Knowing the kind of sickness, drive, what I call sickness, drive, hunger, discipline, everything that they're going to have to throw at, how much sacrifice they will have to make in their life to make that happen, do you think they should do it? Well, I think it doesn't matter what I say. I think it's either innate in you or it's not. You know what I mean? You get 10 people in a room. You have 10 different personalities, right? Some people choose to sit down. Some people choose to stand up. So I could sit there and say, go for it, go for it, go for it. But at the end of the day, that may not make a difference. It's like telling a smoker to stop smoking. They're not going to want to stop smoking unless they want to stop smoking. I would say that each person should be the best they can be. You know, some people are better looking, some people are smarter, some people have different attributes, different talents. I say use that talent to the best of your ability to maximize um, your, your, the value of your life and, and, and see that you're using it and that you're, you're happy doing it. And that's what I think is the most important thing. Success is measured by happiness not by who you are, how much money you have, or what car you have. That, to me, is what I believe happiness is and success. I I totally agree with that. And I totally agree with what you're saying about you can tell them all you want. Uh, Some people just, they don't have that. I am, however, a hopeless romantic. (laughs) And so if you would allow, uh, this is how I see it. Chris, I secretly hope that there are people out there for whom they need a nudge one way or the other. And because I'm a much bigger believer in epigenetics than I am genetics, I think genetics plays a factor, obviously. Sure. Uh, the way you look, eye color, uh, right, right. all that, there's going to be family resemblance and there are certain things that just code in your DNA. I totally right. get that. There are also things, however, that code in epigenetics. You so they change. respond to the environment. Mm-hmm. We have total control over them. We can Absolutely. change them at will. Because of that, And because my life is a result of some nudges that I received along the way that began to change my mindset and gave me different building blocks to build up. And literally the whole premise of the show is they're going to meet people like you and they're going to hear that story that you told earlier about paying with sweat equity and that you ground it out and they're going to stop seeing the end result and start thinking about that journey that you're still on and then realize, oh, well, okay, I may not be there, but I can take that first step, right? So my belief is that People, if they're considering going down that path, right, the path of really echoing in this world, if they're considering it, they should do it. Now, for all the people that don't want that, they want to live what I think of as as a more monastic life, they want peace and tranquility, which is not what you get going down the other path of drive and hunger and really, because I believe even the hunger and the drive is cultivated, right? So you're gonna be be doing things to keep yourself focused, to keep yourself driving forward. And the reason I think they should do it is exactly 
because of what you're doing with this modern day telethon. Because you have that, because you have that hunger and drive, because somewhere down the line you decided Chris Angel was going to become what Chris Angel has become and you were willing to pay the price to get there, you now have a tool set, right? Think of Liam Neeson in right. Taken. It's like he has a certain tool set and he can use that tool set to do something. And that to me is what it's about. It's about acquiring those skills. But if you don't put yourself down the path of I'm going right. to acquire as many skills as I can and think about how many people you're going to be able to help because that wasn't the life that they chose. And that to me, like you said, that's an equally beautiful decision, right? right. If it's really what fulfills you, makes you happy, that's awesome. I don't pass any judgment on right. that. I'm just talking to the okay. people for whom it's a nudge one way okay. or the other. So here it is. Life is death without change. Are you willing to make a change in your life to realize a dream, to fulfill what's in your mind, what you can visualize as your life? And are you willing to put the sweat equity, the time, the persistency mm -hmm. that it takes, not on your timetable, but on fate's timetable? If you are, then you have to educate yourself in whatever that subject matter is. You have to immerse yourself in that. Get as much knowledge, as much information. And my dad always used to say to me, you want to be successful, hang around successful people that are more successful than you. If you hang out with shit, you start to smell like that. <laughs> and it's true. So immerse, like yourself, your immerse yourself with people that are doing what you want to do and understand how they think and what they think. See the things that are correct and also see the things that are not correct, so yet you learn from their mistakes, right? And then you can't be scared to fail. Mm. Failure is the next step to success because with failure, you're learning what not to do. So it's, it's acquiring all the information, it's taking a chance, it's putting yourself out there in a way that might be a little uncomfortable. You know, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to have criticism. You have to be willing to listen to people that you can trust, whether it's your intimate friends, your spouse, your, your family, to get their advice. And, you know, depending upon what it is, I, I say do it for free. Just to get that experience, that on-the-job training that is so imperative, even if it requires school, do it, you know, as a side job, so yeah, as an intern, to really see what's, what's involved. Um, and, and, and I remember speaking of that for myself. When I was 17 years young, I got invited uh, by a guy named Vito Lupo, a magician, to go to Monte Carlo for three weeks. I had to pay uh, for certain things, but basically I went there to, to be the technician in his box to hand him stuff without anybody ever seeing me from the stage. It was three weeks that cost me money to go inside a box and hand him a ball, hit a smoke machine, you know, whatever I had, hand him a magic wand, whatever I had to do, and I would never trade that for anything. There's no substitute for that experience. That is unbelievably good advice. It's exactly the advice I hope people take because that I think that's one of the only paths to success is somebody who's young and inexperienced. I want to go back to something you were saying because it there's an awesome Chris Angel story around what you said about don't be afraid to make mistakes. This this to me shows who you are. So when Believe the first show opened, um, it didn't get very good reviews. It's horrible. It was horrible. Horrible. I never saw it so I can't say. Yeah. Um, the show was great. The problem with the show is that Chris Angel was in it. And everybody was coming to see what Chris Angel did on television, Mind right. Freak. And Cirque had me do a show where I wasn't playing Chris Angel. Mm -hmm. If there were another magician in the show, that show would have still been playing. It was a very good show. Um, but yeah, I got my ass handed to me. And it was the very first Cirque production that ever had a star in it. Right. So it wasn't a nameless face that the press was piling on. It was Chris Angel. And it was fun to pile on the bad boy that was on television with Mind Freak that had this, you know, uh, very uh, big persona. Um, now, I could have walked away from that situation or I could have dug deep. And there was no way I was walking away because I knew what I was capable of. And I just needed the opportunity. 
and I put together the new version of Believe, which gained critical acclaim, gained incredible reviews um, from not only the press but the public. And after seven and a half, three thousand shows, I still wasn't content because I knew I was capable of much more. Not because of money, not because of fame. It was because as an artist, I wasn't fulfilled and I wanted to show myself and I wanted to show the world and I also wanted to perpetuate magic which was such a beautiful art that has perpetuated me so far that I wanted to give back to show that we can take leaps and bounds with technology, with revolutionary illusions and with how we present it in creating an experience that magic has never seen before. And Cirque and Luxor gave me the opportunity with an offer I could not refuse as a director, as an executive producer, and as the creator to do just that. And I took that opportunity and I took things that I was working on for almost 20 years and I put it together in five weeks. Five weeks to show close, the old show was loaded out, the new show came in, I worked 23 hours and 15 minutes sometimes a day, seven days a week with my incredible team and we got it done. And we really created something that I believe will not be touched by the world of magic for 25 years. And I don't say that conceited, I say that rather confidently. Yeah. And knowing the work that you put into it, I have no doubt. And that's the important thing, like as you were giving that advice, I thought, wow, this is the most real like meaning if you take this advice it will actually work and I lived it. 100%. I lived it. I had every press person jumping, piling on, saying every possible thing you can say negative about me. Mm. And it was a it was a, a dark time for me. You know, Dave Barham was my rock, you know, he was the guy who believed in me. I believed in myself and uh, we weathered a very difficult storm. And I might add that the shows that opened at that time that were uh, the darlings of the press no longer exist. Right. I'm still right. here. And, you know, if you believe and you work hard, um, you can win the war. You might lose a battle or two. Right. Man, it's just amazing. Like, I think when people, so my, I believe one of the cornerstones of success from just a personality standpoint is the ability to what I call recenter emotionally. So you get hit, you get knocked, people are coming after you, whatever the case may be. Most people at that point, they shut down. That's it, right? That's the end. Like, they just fade away. And I know that people were expecting that of you. And I love that the, the pinnacle of your success came after that when you said, you know, look, I'm not going to go out like that. I have a vision for my art. Yeah. Which I love the way you talk about magic and, and the reverence. So having been through your private collection, dude, it's so beautiful. The reverence with which you display it all, talk about it all, the, the things that you have that, yeah, that really means something to you. It's just super, super incredible to see somebody who fought through that, had to emotionally recenter, learn something new to your dad's point about know more about it than anybody else, learn all the skills, immerse yourself. And then you made a show that was better and more you and, and then went on to be a smash. And I've seen that show, uh, the second incantation of Believe, uh, 10 times minimum. Uh, just amazing. And how the audience like is, it, you know when they're going to go crazy, right? Because you've so mastered the human psychology and connection. And it, it's just a really, really incredible experience. I know I'm fanboying out a little bit here, but it was, that was so cool for me. And to be able to go backstage and to see how it's all put on is just... It really is impressive, man. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is, is that I was never given money. Everything that I have that I own, I worked for. Nothing was a gift. Mm. And anyone watching this right now can go out and do it. And the magicians that are out there that want to call me out and say this and say that, instead of wasting their energy doing that, go out and work and accomplish something greater than what I have. Right. Because actions speak a lot louder than words. Sure. You know, it's easy to talk, but the action is much more difficult. I think of this as a UFC fight. I'm a very competitive, I'm an athlete, and I look at it as a chess game. And it's me 
winning the goal of what I set for myself to accomplish. And whatever comes in my way, I'll be a ninja and get through it. However I have to do it, it will happen. Maybe not on my timetable, but it will happen. And you have to be that committed, that passionate, and that willing to be able to make adjustments so that you're flexible, you're like water, you can get through anything. And when you know something's not right, you have to fix it and you have to correct it and then move forward. What does the future look like for you? What's a goal that you've yet to accomplish? Well, I have a brand new television special I'm back home on A&E come this October. It's called Tricked with the Supernaturalists. It is by far the most provocative, up close, in your face, some might say obnoxious, <laughs> magic TV special of all time. It's going to have the most revolutionary demonstrations with the biggest stars like Michael Jackson's daughter, Paris Jackson, which stood on this stage with me in my brand new revolutionary levitation where I floated all over the place, flew around, flipped around, flew from the stage right over the audience, through the lobby, through the wow. casino, through the front doors. That is crazy. Paris said, if I weren't here seeing that, I could never believe that this was possible, that it wasn't camera tricks, movie magic, yeah. but I've seen it for myself and the audience sees it for themselves every night that they come to Chris Angel Mind Freak Live here at the Luxor. So that's going to be in the show. You have, you know, Steve Aoki, an incredible DJ, so successful on my show. You have uh, someone like Paige Van Zant, a young, incredible mixed martial artist who was just on Dancing with the Stars, who I'm doing an incredible demonstration with her. Um, Gary Oldman, the you know legendary actor is doing the show and I'm doing just the craziest demonstrations that I've been working in my 60,000 foot laboratory for many years employing the best minds to help facilitate the most incredible illusions not only in Mind Freak Live but on Tricked October on A&E that's a huge thing for me and uh, and even more important than that is September 12th my Heal Every Life Possible Help, uh, which will take place on this stage. And as I said, people can get information. I know you're going to be here. Uh, ChrisAngelHelp.com for those who want to make a difference in the world. Yeah, man, and I really want to thank you for what you're doing. I share, obviously, a deep passion for cancer research and, and making real strides to ending that. And um, obviously, at Quest, we're super committed to that. And, and just it's such an honor to see how hard you're working and how... Uh, you make the dollar efficient. It's really, really cool to see, man. So. Well, I, I, uh, I appreciate Quest, and I just want to say one thing. Um, I started eating Quest bars. <laughs> this is my favorite, by the I way. I promise this was not this a setup. Is not, this, I swear on my life this wasn't. But this is how much I believe in this product. Oh, I was not paid you. for this. Uh, I didn't even know you when I started eating this. I was given this Quest bar, uh, Cookies and Cream, which is my favorite, by a guy named Dave Palumbo, who yes, um, right. is a nutritionist, my nutritionist, who turned me on to this bar uh, when I couldn't get adequate meals. And this bar is uh, incredible, not only because of the protein it produces, but because of you know, the calories, the low calories, uh, non-sugars, and all of that stuff. I eat, you know, uh, many of these and uh, swear by these and I've turned on so many people, celebrities and non-celebrities um, to this. But the fact that you guys have taken the painstaking process to create the best bar in the marketplace is really unbelievable. And the fact that now you're doing research on behalf of cancer patients and the research that you've done on dogs and how successful that has been is really so promising for the future success in, you know, um, finding a cure for cancer that might be just in the food you eat, right. not necessarily in the poison that you get to kill the cancer. Right. So we're really excited um, about that. And, um, 
you know, anything that I can do to perpetuate that cause, I'm down for. Thank you, man. I, that means a lot, obviously, and you carry a lot of weight. And um, you guys know if you watch the show regularly, I never promote Quest. I don't talk about the things. That no, we're I'm promoting it because I believe in it. No, and I really, really. And I and I know you 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 didn't even know I was going to do this. So I just want people kind. to understand. Um, that's how much I believe in this product. Uh, and, and I don't do that uh, with products. I only do it with things that I believe in or that's part of my lifestyle. And Quest is definitely part of my lifestyle. That, that's super awesome. Thank you. And if you guys want to learn more about what we are doing in cancer, um, you can go to ketopetsanctuary.com and learn more about that. It's, it's just a really exciting time in research. And look, we don't like to overstate things, but there's some incredible, incredible data um, coming out of research into ketogenics specifically. Uh, so if you want to learn more, uh, that's where you can go. And where should they go to learn more about Chris Angel? Well, they can just go to chrisangel.com or follow me at chrisangel on Twitter or Instagram. Or just come to the Luxor here in Las Vegas and see Chris Angel Mind Freak live for yourself. I guarantee you it will be an experience that you won't forget. Chris, thank you so thank much. Thank you man. so much what for having me. an absolute me. pleasure for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Really, really cool. Guys, go back, rewatch this episode. This has been some of the most real advice from somebody. You remember, you have to think of him as starting with nothing and building his way to something that is truly only adequately described as an empire. What he's done is incredible. The more you're gonna dig into the business side of what he's done, the more you're gonna be blown away. He's retained control of so many amazing things. There are Oprah aspects of what he's done in his business, which is why he's had the kind of success that he's had. He is a creative first and that comes through in anything that he does, just the way in which he approaches it with artistry. But if you were listening today, he gave away what I think is the absolute secret to the universe. And that's that there's no difference between you and him. It's just a bunch of hard work. That's it. And if you're willing to go in, grind it out, find somebody who's doing what you want to do, go to them. Don't worry about the money. Crawl inside the box, hand the balls, hit the smoke machine, whatever you need to do. Guys, that really is it, man. That's exactly what I did. Not so much the box and the smoke, but literally go to people who know more than you and say you just want to learn. You're not worried about the money. You just want to learn. So watch it twice. It is the most real advice, I think, that we've seen on this show. So guys, thank you so much. And Chris, thank you thank again you so for much. being on the show, man. Thank you. And if people want more info on the business aspect of it, there was just a beautiful Bloomberg Business Week piece that just came out on my company oh, wow. so people can also find out what goes on behind the scenes with the business aspect of it wow. well i will definitely read that guys i suggest you do the same i know the tale relatively well and it's astounding so until next time my friends be legendary take care <laughs> chris, chris thank you for having me man. Man, Jesus, that was awesome.